to a special edition of Wealth Wednesdays. We're launching a national campaign called Real Estate Reset, Breaking Down Barriers to Home Ownership in a COVID-19 World. I'm Angela Yee. And I'm Stacey Tisdale. And in this episode of Wealth Wednesdays, we're going to focus on one of the most important factors in wealth building, and that's home ownership. My name is Sarah Davis. I live in the metro Atlanta area. I'm an educator. I'm a wife, a mother to an awesome five-year-old named Brooklyn. The moment that we actually like signed all of the paperwork and formally received the keys for our home, I just felt such joy and excitement. Give me a high five. And then bringing her to our home and telling her like, this is your home, this is your house. That moment was really powerful. All human beings psychologically have a need for home, that sense of home. And for African Americans, what's critical to understand is that this sense of home takes on heightened significance by virtue of their experiences with being subjected to systematic devaluation and discrimination. Because with home ownership comes what? Power, security, control, valuation, a sense of achievement. It doesn't have to be rare. It doesn't have to feel unheard of. You don't have to suffer with imposter syndrome or any of those things. Like you deserve a home just like anybody else. For the black community, the picture has not been good. Black home ownership is at its lowest level in 50 years. Meanwhile, white home ownership is on the rise. So our goal is to raise awareness to help break down systemic barriers that have blocked the home ownership path for Blacks in the United States for generations. Hey, we're not messing around. We partnered with Rocket Mortgage for a series of national conversations aimed at closing the wealth gap between Black and white Americans. We're calling it Real Estate Reset. We've assembled an amazing team of experts to bring you the information, resources, and even the emotional support that you need. Whether you're already a homeowner, someone who's trying to buy a home for the first time, or someone who thinks that home ownership is beyond their grasp. Obviously, we're in a challenging time given the economic uncertainty caused by COVID-19. Millions have lost their jobs, and it's been especially devastating to the Black community. Economic inequality and the wealth gap often result in Blacks working and living in conditions that result in higher infection rates from the virus. In fact, Blacks between the ages of 35 and 44 die at a rate nearly eight times higher than whites, according to the CDC National Center of Health Statistics. Real Estate Reset is all about tapping into the urgency of the moment and recognizing the opportunity for change. So Team Wealth Wednesdays, how do we close a Black home ownership gap? We'll get educated about what caused the situation. We'll talk about how vital home ownership is to building your wealth. And we'll answer your questions about how to make home ownership a reality, even if you have no idea how or where to start. Believe me, you can do it. My major fear was, you know, what's going to happen? Am I going to be able to afford it? Am I going to be able to flip this home? You know, uh, my first house when I first bought it was, you know, me living in the house. What happened if something happens? What happened if I get fired? What happened if I get injured? How will my family be? And the way I got over those fears was I realized that you look at some of the richest people in the world, they just did it. They just went out there and did it. And that's what I did. I bought my first home. I moved my family in. I sold it six months later and I made $80,000. And after that, I was hooked. I mean, we just did it and I continue to do it now. Now I don't second guess myself. If the number's bright, the project is right, I'm gonna do it. I took the huge step of buying my first home back in 2013. And I was lucky enough to find someone who would be more than a real estate agent, an actual partner. And now she's a really good friend of mine. Her name is Sarah Golan of Nest Seekers Real Estate and she's joining us now. So Sarah, I just want to talk about what your theory is about how a realtor should treat their client and why it's important to have a realtor. I see a lot of people talking about how you can just look online and find something and then you can buy a house that way. But what's the importance of what you do and how important it is to clients? What services do you provide and what makes you so outstanding? I think first off, having a realtor by your side, it's really important because you have a partner who's shopping, who's doing the research for you as a buyer wouldn't. And in the sense that they're looking not just at the finances, they're really listening to what you're searching for and what you're saying to them. And if they're taking all of that information 
and using their expertise, they're able to find you the perfect home. It's, it's matching you to not just a great investment, but um, your home. It's where you're going to live and build a family and have great memories. So you want to have somebody who's very conscious of what you're really searching for and what your goals are. So a true partner in the process. So Sarah, you also gave me advice. You said when you buy your first home, look at this as not your be all end all only home ever. It's just your first home. Right. Because I feel that real estate, it's one, uh, it's an important way to build wealth for yourself and just getting into the market and building equity on a property. And you can always resell that home and move into your dream home if this wasn't the one this was just your starter home and you have some money saved up and you're looking for an investment um, you can live there and i think it's important to know when you're going out there that realtors the ones that are representing the sellers that's what they're doing they're representing the interests of the seller so you have a buyer's agent along your side to advocate for you. The conversation that they will have with you is not the same conversation they will have with the broker. So be very conscious of that. They're trying to get the best price for the seller, mm -hmm. um, not to negotiate the best deal on your behalf. All right, so let's talk about the latest investment that we are doing together. We're actually in the process of getting this off the ground. We have a third property that we worked on and it was really important for me to have Sarah there because with coronavirus, it's been a different type of time with the real estate market. So this is how it went down. They gave us one hour to come and see this property between 10 and 11 a.m. And then they said, okay, after that, we're taking final offers, your best and final offer. And then we're choosing from those offers. So here's how it played out. 13 people showed up in that one hour and seven of them made offers from that one showing. So Sarah, walk us through what that process has been like. We had a strategy going in there and I knew what it was that, you know, I had to introduce you as not just any buyer. Um, and that's why I asked for, the, for your bio when we submitted the offer, because I wanted them to see that you are a true Brooklynite you're a seasoned investor um, and you have, you're coming with, with a broker with the experience that who's going to really work to negotiate the best offer. Um, and we know that we're, you know, we have to be competitive and we work. Um, but I had a strategy to, you know what, when they ask for best and final, you have to wait until that moment comes and you give it your all and you, you want to be different from the rest of the group. So the broker called me right away and we had that conversation after the offer was submitted. I kept following up because you know me, I'm not going to give up um, until I have answers. And that day we got good news that the offer was accepted. And, you know, it wasn't even the highest offer that they got. So I think that was important, too, because I have my broker with me. She knows the neighborhood. She's done the research. She also was having conversations with the seller's broker. And that was even before I entered the picture. So she could see how serious we were. And I do believe there's a difference between being persistent and annoying. And Sarah is persistent. And she'll let you know, hey, we're very serious about what it is that we want. We mean business. And all of those things were really important. Like Sarah said, she was like, you have to differentiate yourself among the offers that they received. And one thing she did was recommend that I write a personal letter. She also told me I should submit my bio. And truthfully, those things really did make a huge difference when it came to us getting our offer accepted. I think that people thought that buying houses was slow right now. Things would slow down with coronavirus and prices would drop. But in Brooklyn, that definitely hasn't happened. Interest rates are really low. It's a buyer's market. Inventory, yes, it's a little lower than it was. And you do have stiff competition, but you're still able to find a great deal. You just got to negotiate a little bit harder to get that. All right. So again, thank you. Now I do want to tell you, I highly recommend whoever you choose is a professional. You guys know I love Sarah and I am willing to share her with other people. So if you need a great realtor, 
Sarah is your person. But I do have to say, having someone on board who's an expert, it made me feel so much more comfortable. It's definitely a positive that works on your side. So thank you, Sarah. Angela, you and Sarah make such an awesome team. But I want to go from your personal history to the bigger picture of how and why home ownership has eluded most of the Black community in this country. It's a story that is heartbreaking and enraging and probably shocking to most people. These are the numbers we need to change. While 72% of whites are homeowners, just over 40% of blacks own a home. And that translates to an even more upsetting fact. The median net worth for blacks is just one-tenth that of whites. And that wealth gap controls much of the inequality that we have in this country today. Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, lays out how black families came to be stuck in neighborhoods with lesser quality schools, poor health outcomes, high crime, and few good jobs. Why? In a word, segregation. Segregation imposed by our own U.S. government. The racial segregation that exists in every metropolitan area in this country was created by racially explicit government policy, government regulation, designed to ensure that we created separate residential areas by race everywhere in the country. It began in the Great Depression. With masses of Americans homeless, the government built the first public housing, separate projects for whites and blacks. Two new government agencies were created to rescue homeowners facing foreclosure and make it easier for people to buy homes with new federally insured mortgages. So 20% down payment and $40 a month will buy an attractive bungalow like this. It was a great deal as long as you were white. The federal government did not insure or refinance all mortgages. Lance Freeman is a professor of urban planning at Columbia University. They created maps and, and weighted neighborhoods, grades A through D, D being the most risky. In their remarks, appraisers left no doubt that race determined risk, referring to infiltration of Negroes as the reason not to invest in a neighborhood. The presence of even just a single black person in the neighborhood or a block would be taken as a signal that, oh, that neighborhood is going to decline. And those were often color-coded with red. So that's where the term redlining came from. This is Levittown, Pennsylvania. After World War II, the government began a program to move the entire working class population to the suburbs. But there was a catch. These new communities were for whites only. In fact, in order to get federal funding, William Levitt and other builders had to commit never to sell their homes to black people. And the Federal Housing Administration required him, required him to place a clause in the deed of every home in Levittown, prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. Even though deed restrictions were soon struck down and the GI Bill guaranteed a no down payment mortgage to all World War II vets, African Americans were frequently shut out. And being blocked from home ownership meant being blocked from participating in the vast accumulation of wealth that created the American middle class. The white families who bought those homes gained over the next generation or two uh, equity, wealth, $300,000, $400,000, $500,000 in wealth. So the children today of those parents are able to inherit the wealth of that home. And that's what differentiates those white people today from their African-American counterparts. And so it's being denied access to those types of opportunities historically that has a contemporary impact. Stacy, that really is a shocking history lesson, but it's one that many Black Americans have experienced firsthand. And that includes the family of our next guest, Senator Cory Booker from New Jersey. Senator, thank you so much for spending some time with us. It's always great to be with you and especially on a, a, such an important topic. So thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. And interestingly, Senator, I think you were born one year before the Fair Housing Act was passed, but not quite so fair. Your family had quite an interesting story of what it took to get them into a home in New Jersey. Can you share that with us? Yeah. You know, my parents came up in the late 60s uh, to look for a place to live with great public schools. But every time they would show up in a white community, they would be lied to. They would be told that the house was sold or pulled off the market. 
and they were lucky. They, I, they just, uh, they found a woman named Miss Lee Porter, who's, she's 93 right now and still doing this work for the Fair Housing Council. But she and others organized this sting operation where they made, uh, they got a white couple to volunteer or multiple white couples to volunteer to follow my parents around. And on the house I would grow up in, they literally uh, were told it was sold. The white couple put a bid on the house. The bid was accepted. Uh, mm-hmm. And on the day of the closing, uh, the white couple did not show up. My father did and a volunteer lawyer. And amazingly, the real estate agent still didn't give up. He gets up and punches my dad's lawyer in the face, sigs a dog on my dad. It's just a melee breaks out in the office. Uh, but eventually, after a lot of legal rigmaroles, we became the first black family to move into what became for my family, just a, a really incredible town. And I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for that kind of activism amongst people in that community that just said, this is wrong. But New Jersey, the history of our state is actually kind of tragic. It reflects the history of the country about how discriminatory housing practices really created poverty, drained wealth away from African-Americans, uh, systemically created pockets of poverty and compounded a lot of other problems. And so we are still living in a nation where the that overt housing discrimination up to the 70s still lingers within uh, our communities and has really drained. It's one of the reasons why, frankly, African-Americans in this country have about one-tenth of the wealth that white Americans have is because a lot of those vehicles from the GI Bill, FHA policies, uh, all of these things that helped build so much middle-class wealth in America were denied African-American families where they were literally often by physical force stopped from buying homes in communities where their housing values would continue to grow. I know you've been a proponent of tenants' rights and getting more renters into home ownership. And as, as you just touched on, this has a big impact on the overall wealth gap. Tell us, when, what can we do with that tenant piece, getting more people into home ownership and isn't it true that the wealth gap can't really close until we close this housing gap? Yeah, well, look, we, we are a nation that most people don't know this, but we use 600 to $700 billion every year through our tax code, giving people with wealth the tax breaks to create more wealth. So the mortgage interest deduction, which is something I support, but it's overwhelmingly used by people who are wealthier, making quarter of a million dollar or more. And there's a lot of things that we can do to start to give lower income families through our tax code, the same opportunities to build wealth. And they range from everything from a renter getting a, getting a, a, a tax uh, uh, a credit. For example, if you're paying more than 30% of your rent, of your income in rent, I propose through legislation uh, that you get a, a tax credit uh, a back, just like the earned income tax credit all the way to something that's an idea that I'm, of mine that I, I'm really happy a lot more senators are signing on to, something called baby bonds, which is just this idea that we use uh, our tax code again, that every child born in America gets a savings account that can then grow, interest-bearing savings account, that every year you get money added to that depending on the wealth of your family, which would mean the lowest income Americans, one out of every six children in America is at or below the poverty line, that they would have upwards because of compounding interest of about forty to fifty thousand dollars. Again, it's supported by the National Home Builders because that's a down payment on a home right there. Mm-hmm. So we've got to start doing things in America that help families, struggling families. Paychecks just help you get by, but wealth helps you get ahead. And we we should have more strategies to help low income people build wealth as opposed to what our tax code does, which is overwhelmingly helps wealthy people uh, create more wealth. Now, Senator Cory Booker, you know we are all about seizing this moment of change to close the housing gap between Blacks and whites. Of course, the pandemic has put a tremendous stress on the economy, particularly in the Black community, as we've been discussing. So how do you see progress on Black home ownership happening now? And how can we also position ourselves so we can take advantage of this unique time? Well, we have to have an agenda uh, for just that, for wealth creation, for balancing wealth. And, and it has to be overt. That's why the baby bonds idea literally will close the wealth gap between blacks and whites because while there are more white people who are poor in America, but disproportionately there are more African Americans. So for plans like that will actually help build African American wealth. But we've got to go further than that and do a lot more. 
Uh, we've got to actually help first-time homebuyer programs uh, that give more people a, a down payment assistance. Me and a bunch of senators in this pandemic crisis got together to propose uh, helping people with down payment assistance to buying a home. We have got to become a country, and this is why I love your forum that you've created, that really is about wealth creation and closing that wealth gap in America. When you look at the demographics that the census is putting out, people of color in the black population are going to be the majority population within the next decade. Just to imagine, what is the United States economy like if the majority population is at the bottom end of the wealth gap? How, this is really everybody's problem. This COVID crisis is a great example of that. The businesses that have been disproportionately hit have been minority businesses because they're less likely to have banking relationships and they're less likely to have cash reserves. And, and this, you know, I saw this really interesting watchdog group that followed, uh, that actually sent two people in to get uh, PPP grants and loans through banks and with the same exact paperwork, and the black person was treated uh, far worse in terms of giving access to different products than the white person. So we still live in a country where even the loan worthiness, if it's equal in terms of person's income and other elements, that African-Americans aren't having that same access to the world of banking. Black businesses don't have those banking relationships. So the last recession, the, the black-white wealth gap was closing for most of my life from the late 60s until the early 2000s. But the last recession, um, a devastated black wealth and sent the black white wealth gap back to where it was around the time I was born in the 60s. And this is another recession right now that threatens to do the same thing. We're seeing disproportionate impact on black families, disproportionate impact on black and brown businesses. And unless we have strategies to deal with that, all of our economy is going to hurt. And so my worry is, is that we're not going to do those things. And we're going to come out of this with African-Americans further behind than they were even before this crisis. We need affirmative strategies to try to make sure uh, we are preserving pathways to wealth and prosperity for all Americans. If we don't, then all Americans are going to hurt as a result of it. And I just think about all the stress and anxiety this causes too. When we think about the wealth gap and home ownership and not knowing if you are going to have a place to live when you retire, what happens at a time like this when there's a pandemic? And, you know, you grew up very successfully in a neighborhood where most people didn't look like you. So we've talked about how just a handful of positive pair contacts between blacks and whites have been shown to reduce racial tension. Do you see any hope in the multiracial makeup of the ongoing protests against racist police brutality? Angel, you dropped a lot of <laughs> wisdom in that, in that short phrase. You like did it at like a machine gun of wisdom. So I just want to affirm, say hallelujah to a couple of points you made. The first one is the, the mental well-being of a family under economic stress, the, the, the impact it has on your physical health to constantly be in that stress and insecurity, have that cortisol constantly firing in your brain, deters child development, as well as uh, the, the, the overall health and well-being of families. That's why, again, the health outcomes for black family, black and brown folks, and, and poor folks are so much worse than people that don't have that constant stress. The, the next thing you were just saying about this idea that we have to, as a society, understand that housing is connected to every other element of well-being. Remember, housing deals with your access to quality schools. Housing deals with your access. In fact, the number one predictor, the best predictor of whether you live around toxic waste sites or drink dirty water is the color of your skin. That's housing. So what you also said there about why housing is such a great fulcrum point to overall well-being is really important. And so this is the one thing that I am hopeful, the final point that you made in your question, which was it, 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 there is so much power for uh, low-income children of any color who grow up and have peer groups that have other, other, that are other quintiles of wealth. This idea of integration of, of, of ethnic, racial, religious, um, and, and socioeconomic status is so good for the whole. Diversity is not just some nice little um, adornment to have. It is actually makes us a stronger nation when we're more integrated and, more, and we see each other as all being in it together, having the common destiny. And so to have more white Americans, and you can see it by the polling, waking up to historic racism, becoming more knowledgeable about the, the history that we, don't, we didn't read as much about in our, in, our, in our history textbooks when we were growing up. I mean, I was a black kid, didn't, even, even the history books we were reading from 
so diminished aspects and contributions of the history of diverse populations in our country. And so to, to see this awakening right now that's so powerful and it's driving many white communities to the streets, to leaders in protests around Black Lives Matter, it is very hopeful to me, Angela, and I'm hoping it sustains so that we actually see the policy changes that often follow the activism. Remember, the Voting Rights Act did not come, but it wasn't a bunch of guys getting together on the Senate floor saying, hey, let's give voting. No, it came from activism. The right to vote for women didn't come because a bunch of men got together on the Senate floor and said, hey, fellas, let's give women the right to vote. It followed activism. Uh, of, um, all, the, all the great change from workers' rights to civil rights has always come from people taking to the streets first in multiracial rainbow coalitions that ultimately made change happen. And that's what we have to sustain right now. We are with you, Senator. Thank you so much for joining us and for understanding and teaming with us as we work to close the housing gap through awareness, through bringing people together. It was just an honor and a pleasure. And we'd like to thank you for joining our Real Estate Reset and Wealth Wednesdays community. Well, I love the forum, what you're doing. Uh, the last thing I'll say, when I was mayor, we just held, did the exact same thing in an informal community. We had financial empowerment seminars, helping to take people from debt uh, into home ownership. There is a pathway for everybody. You just need to know, make a plan, and execute that plan. And I'm so grateful that you all are just bringing this wisdom and an inspiration to a lot of people who find themselves constantly in a state of struggle and exposing them to a lot of the resources and opportunities. Thank you for doing what you do. You guys are light workers in so many ways. We appreciate you. We know it's been a stressful time as well for you having to represent us. So we appreciate you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. As we know, housing discrimination has a deeply rooted history that affects us to this day. But that doesn't mean we can't change the future. We have to ask ourselves some honest questions about home ownership. But just like you heard Senator Cory Booker say, there's no denying it is one of the best ways to build generational wealth. The Census Bureau finds that a renter's median net worth is only $2,381, while a homeowner's net worth is $205,300. In addition, homeowners typically have to put down 20% or less to buy a home. The bank finances the rest at low interest rates over as much as 30 years. Homeownership also brings tax advantages with homeowners able to deduct mortgage interest and property taxes from their income. In most cases, homeowners can exclude capital gains from taxable income as well. The government also promotes generational wealth building through homeownership as children only pay taxes when they sell the home. Still, there is a lot more to home ownership and wealth building than dollars and cents. The voice of justice speaks again. Fair housing for all is now a part of the American way of life. The Fair Housing Act was signed into law 50 years ago. How is it that the rate of black home ownership is no higher today than it was then? Fair lending laws made access to credit easier for African Americans, and many were able to buy homes. But when banking regulations were eased in the 1970s, the seeds of the foreclosure crisis were planted. Banks now could charge whatever they wanted to in terms of interest rates. So instead of not, uh, restricting access to credit, they just simply said, well, we'll charge more for access to credit. And this is where subprime lending starts to take off. And so they targeted these neighborhoods for subprime loans, and they targeted Blacks for subprime loans. So when the economy collapsed and home prices plummeted, a staggering 244,000 African Americans lost their homes to foreclosure. Many people had loans that they could not afford, and they couldn't sell their house, right, because they were under water. So the subprime lending, the bursting of the housing bubble, really wiped out several decades of progress in terms of the home ownership rate. And, it, you know, it's, it's really put us back literally 50 years. We have no way to predict how bad the impact of COVID-19 will be on the Black community, but we know it will be far more devastating for Blacks than for whites. So it's more important than ever to arm ourselves with knowledge about how to protect our families and our future. 
Now let's turn to two real estate experts who will have answers for some of the questions you've sent us. And of course, answer some of our questions too. Danielle McCoy is Vice President and Fair Lending Officer at Fannie Mae and John Hope Bryant. He's the Operation Hope Founder and Chairman. He's also CEO of Promise Homes, one of the largest minority led owners of single family properties in the United States. Danielle, let's start with you. From your vantage point at Fannie Mae, how is COVID-19 affecting the housing market? Thanks, Stacey. So COVID-19 has caused unpre unprecedented financial issues for a lot of renters and homeowners. And actually, Fannie Mae does weekly surveys. And in our most recent, recent survey, which has been about three months into the crisis, we found that about 40% of renters are struggling, as well as a third of mortgage holders. For people in this position, one of the key things is to know that they have options and to really research their options. To do this on Fannie Mae.com, they can go to our portal. It's called Here to Help. And we have a lot of useful information for homeowners and renters. John, how big of a blow is COVID-19 to the struggle Blacks were already having in the housing market? And if you can put into context for us the magnitude of this moment for the financial future of the Black community. Well, it's an excellent question. It's almost everything. This is a black swan moment in the sense that all bad things happened at the same time. Uh, you've got a health crisis uh, that's literally trying to separate your health uh, from your uh, spiritual wealth. Uh, COVID-19, a pandemic. You've got an economic crisis happening at the same time brought on by the health crisis. And we're ill-prepared for both. Um, and that makes you less prepared for the opportunity that's actually on the other side of all of this stuff that we really should be focusing on right now. The health crisis uh, is, in, is unfortunately informed a lot by the fact that we are not socially distanced. Our jobs are not, for the most part, socially distanced in our community. Uh, we are high school educated more than we are college educated, which means that we're doing hourly jobs that uh, are at risk. Uh, and many of them, by the way, honorable jobs uh, that involved uh, secondary response right now from nursing and healthcare all, all the way to package delivery and preparation. So very honorable, but it puts us at risk. And then you come home to an apartment building where you have people above you, around you, you're touching the same button everybody else is touching, uh, and you have people all over you. Now you combine all of that with the fact that we had thin financial files. We never got the memo on financial literacy or economics and ownership. So we don't have that wealth. And so when something like this hits, uh, we tend to restrict. And if you own a home, you might, your network may be too thin to keep it. This is the time to double down on home ownership. It, and I know that sounds strange, but the only folks telling you not to own a home are folks who own homes themselves. People on TV telling you not to own a home, and they own a home. Owning a home is a better deal uh, than renting. The tax policy is designed for you to own. The appreciation, depreciation, mortgage interest deduction, uh, this whole thing is set up for you to own a home. We all have to get into that, John, and we all have to take advantage of, I know you've said to me before that America's on sale right now. To get there, Danielle, there's a lot of people out there who right now simply cannot make their housing payment. What are some options out there? I believe a survey by our apartment list found that 32% of Americans haven't made their July housing payment yet. What are some of the options out there? One of the key things to keep in mind is who owns your mortgage. And a lot of people don't know who owns their mortgage. And this is important, especially during the pandemic, because if you have a mortgage that's owned by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or backed by the government, there's certain options available to you. A good way to find out um, whether Fannie Mae owns your loan is to go to Fannie Mae.com. We have a loan lookup tool. We also have a link to Freddie Mac's tool. Once you know who owns your loan, and let's say it is owned by Fannie, Freddie, or government-backed, forbearance may be an option for you. So what is forbearance? Forbearance is a temporary reduction or um, pausing your payment. And there are a lot of ways to get on forbearance. There's a misconception that you have to pay everything back at once. You do not necessarily. You can if you want to, but you do not have to. There are options such as repayment plans, payment deferral, as well as loan modifications. And I think people should really learn about these options. Fannie Mae.com is a great place to start. We have fact sheets and videos about all of these things. Um, we understand that financial terminology can be complex and we wanna just help people navigate this pandemic if they're homeowners. 
great advice on the micro level. And I know our audience really appreciates that. John, just to get back to the macro level a bit, how do we as a nation really begin to unravel the impact that systemic racism has had on black real estate and the wealth gap? Yeah, before I answer that question, I want to just underscore what Danielle has brilliantly said. I need everybody to understand there's a, this is like practical hope. Like I'm not giving you like, we're not giving you like, like, like hopes and dreams here. I can't, literally, America will not fail. Not because it's a moral issue, but because this has affected rich people too. <laughs> Like this wasn't a black crisis. Like this wasn't like a Latino crisis or a poor person's crisis. Like everybody got hit. The Federal Reserve has opened this box and they're not gonna close it until everything's okay. They go, America's uh, Congress and the Senate and the president, whoever's sitting there will keep writing this check until America stabilizes because the economy, it, which is our way of life was put at risk of COVID-19. John, we have a question from Nicole we'd like you to answer. Hi, my name's Nicole Brown and I'm in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And I was wondering, what do I do if I feel like I've been discriminated against during the mortgage process? If you have uh, the same opportunity as the person next to you and the same credit score, uh, then you're being discriminated against. If you, though, live in a 500 credit score neighborhood and your credit score is 550 uh, and your next door neighbor has a 700 credit score and they got a better mortgage than you did, then you're not being discriminated against. So, so we may not understand, like 41% of all black folks, call it half, have a credit score below 620. Not poor people. I mean everybody which means that half of us are just locked out of the free enterprise system. So we may believe that we're being discriminated against because of our race, but you actually may be discriminated against, if you want to call it that, because of your credit score. Um, and, and there is certain discrimination that you can change, the credit score being one of them. Danielle, we do have a question from one of our Wealth Wednesday viewers, and this is Malcolm. Hi, my name is Malcolm, and I'm trying to figure out what kind of lender should I be working with? So there's a variety of lenders, whether it's a brick and mortar branch, bank branch that you think of, a credit union, they're online lenders. Um, there's also mortgage financing available from state finance, housing finance agencies. All of those could be options. What I would suggest is to research the options, see what best fits your financial situation. They all will have different programs and different things for first time homeowners. And another thing that's equally important is that once you find financing, comparison, comparison shop. You need to shop for a mortgage like you shop for a plane ticket or like you shop for a new car. Um, there's a lot of studies that show that people could save as much as $500 a mortgage payment if they just shopped around. So make sure that you're really shopping um, for your mortgage when you when you do decide to buy a house. Right, and of course they still want your business so they will barter with you. Correct, I mean, it's important to know what all your options are and to tell the bank, oh, I got a lower rate at this bank or I got a lower rate at that bank and they'll do the best that they can. But the more aware you are and the more empowered you are of your options, the better negotiating position you'll have. Danielle, can you break down for us what kind of credit and income profile someone needs to become a homeowner? Sure. So I think what I would say is the best thing to do is put yourself in the best position that's as available. Um, there are a lot of options available. There are a lot of different financing available. And credit scores um, don't have to be perfect. I will say, you know, you do see mortgages with 620 credit scores. Um, you see mortgages in the low 600s. But that said, the better your credit score, the more opportunities you will have and the better pricing you can receive. As far as um, income profile, one of the key things that um, banks look at when they're underwriting is what is your debt to your income? And that's a key factor. The debt to income ratio used by banks varies. But again, that, those are things you can do to get ready. Think about how much debt you have as compared to how much uh, money you bring in every month. And that will be a factor people will use when they decide um, how much of a mortgage to give you and what you're eligible for. And keeping that in mind, John, a question for you. So many in our community feel so far behind the eight ball that they don't know where to begin to prepare for home ownership. Here's a question from Tynan. 
Hi, my name is Tyne Leachman. I'm 23 and I'm a senior in college and I have no idea where to start with buying a home. Um, I would love to buy a home in the near future and some direction would be great. It's actually perfect timing. Don't complicate this. Like call Operation Hope or go on the Hope in Hand app on your, on your mobile phone or go onto our website. The, the coaching's free and say, I want to become a homeowner. And they'll open a file for you. They'll help you check your credit score, uh, which is what Danielle just mentioned. You can, they'll level set where you are. If you're in school and you have a job, now you have a source of income. Let's look at that for you. Let's look at all available programs that you may have. And it's interesting, despite that dream of home ownership, but more important to the points you're making, the tool that is for wealth building, some people still wonder if it makes sense for their own personal situations. A question from Jasmine. Hello, my name is Jasmine and I'm from Georgia. I was wondering if it is financially worth it to own a home with the added cost of maintenance and taxes. If you're a one bedroom apartment, can you buy a one bedroom condo or a two bedroom modest home? Uh, yes, you can. And again, you get depreciation. You get to write off every expense. You get to write off all the, so whatever you're spending on maintenance, you gotta get that money back through mortgage, a mortgage payment you're making because you get to write all that off. It drives me nuts when you watch these folks on TV and they said, poor people and struggling people, it's like a conspiracy, shouldn't own a home. And I get on there like, wait a minute, don't you own a home? <laughs> I mean, the only folks, the folks telling you you shouldn't own a home, own a home. It, look, this is, you, wealth creation in this country started with farms, farms. It all started with land. What, did they, what, what was the deal with folks coming here from Europe with, with, uh, that founded America? We're going to give you what? Not, you know, our cheesy boards, land. <laughs> so they're growing any more of it. It's gone up in value, just like stocks in the long arc of history. And you should buy some of it. I don't care what it is. Just buy something. And Danielle, I want to ask you, when it comes to existing homeowners, Fannie Mae is admitting that the average annual mortgage rate for its 2020 will be a record low of 3.2%. How can existing home buyers capitalize on that? And how do they determine if they should refinance? Sure. So if you're thinking about refinancing, the first thing to do is call a few lenders and see what the rates are, what you're eligible for. Um, determine what the cost of refinancing is. You know, a decision whether to refinance will really depend on how long you decide to stay in your house and what rate you could get and the cost um, based on where you live. So you really do, again, need to communicate with your lenders and you need to do some research to see what's out there and what might make the most sense for your financial situation. So John and Danielle, something we'd like for you both to address, the George Floyd murder, the dialogue around the social injustice movement for Blacks, it's really opened a lot of eyes to systemic racism that people of color experience. We would love to get you to describe the opportunity that we have right now and how important it is for us as a society and even the global economy to get this right. John, let's start with you. Well, let's remember that uh, George Floyd, rest his, God rest his soul, was killed in a 570 credit score neighborhood. And let's also remember that 100% of the other unfortunate deaths at the hands of police we're also in sub 600 credit score neighborhoods. Is this a coincidence or is this something to be fixed? The reason I love math is it doesn't have an opinion. And the math shows that most of our homicides, our crimes, our police brutality, the lack of opportunity, the, the one parent households, the, 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 the crime epidemic, the lack of hope are in 500 credit score neighborhoods where you have a check casher next to a payday loan lender, next to a rent to own store, next to a title lender, next to a liquor store in a church down the street trying to make you feel a little bit better about the crappy week you just had. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we have got to get out of the surviving mindset, which is almost like somebody else's conspiracy to keep us where we were, and into a thriving mindset, and better yet, a winning mindset. And that winning mindset is what we've been talking about this whole interview. And you've got to, you've got to look at a glass that's half full and say, is it half full or is it half empty? I think that you're sitting in a moment in history right now, but history doesn't feel historic when you're sitting in it. It just feels like another day. And so what are we going to do with this moment? Because this is a, this is a once in a three generation reset on wealth. 
in America. Let's go get it. And Danielle, if you could weigh in also. Sure, so housing in America has a history of systemic racism. And I think that the tragedies, the murder of George, George Floyd, all the marches you see in the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the, the marches against inequities, period, in our country. I think that it's awakening people to this history and it's educating them about the history. And it's actually impassioned a lot of thought leaders and a lot of corporations to really say that they wanna make change. And I know at Fannie Mae, we're excited to partner with these corporations and thought leaders to make change in the housing industry. So to me, this is a moment of hope, a moment for optimism, a moment where I think that we'll really see new opportunities in the housing market. Danielle McCoy and John Hope Bryant, thank you so much for joining us. Studies have shown that it takes just eight positive contacts between blacks and whites to reduce racial bias and improve diversity outcomes. For example, after World War II, soldiers who'd fought in integrated units reported dramatically reduced racial animosity and greater willingness to work side by side with other races toward a common goal. How could we ever um, develop the common national identity that's essential for preserving this democracy? If so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other, they have no ability to empathize with each other, no ability to uh, identify with each other's life experiences. As we just discussed with John and Danielle, the Black Lives Matter movement seems to have put us at an inflection point where millions of Americans of all races and backgrounds have joined in a more honest dialogue about systemic racism. There seems to be an openness to learn more and to try to address hundreds of years of racial injustice. You only have to glance at the bestsellers list to see how hungry people are for information. And that was also evident in October of last year when HBO series Watchmen first premiered. The series opened with a vivid, gut-wrenching portrayal of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. It was one of the bloodiest riots in American history. But until Watchmen, many Americans knew nothing about it. Millions of eyes were open to what happened, including the simple fact that there was a community of black homeowners and business people living in the Greenwood section of Tulsa until their homes and businesses were burned by a white mob. Today, those events touch a nerve that's even more raw. Been nominated for 26 Emmys, the most of any program, and the series won the prestigious Peabody Award. One of the directors, Nicole Casal, who joins us now. The first time that you heard about this massacre was when you read the Watchmen screenplay. Does that surprise you? Yes, <laughs> yeah. um, it did. It um, astonished me, and you know all the emotions that I realize come from privilege of like, I was ashamed, I'm embarrassed, um, angry that I hadn't been taught. And, um, and, you know, just all those wake up calls of realization, just of, um, you know, that we are our history, yet we've been taught so little of it. And, and now, as an adult, realizing I have to very actively fill in the gaps and do my best for my children, that there's a much richer education. Um, but, you know, what the fascinating thing on Watchmen was, I'd say 95% of the people that read that script were learning about Tulsa through the script. And then, you know, when the show premiered, you know, the first night I remember hearing that over 500,000 
searches went out for Tulsa 21 to find out was that really true. Um, so that it was astonishing and made me understand if I didn't know about that event, there's still so many I don't know, you know, and there's my history is very, actually very thin. So it really changed your whole perspective and understanding of systemic racism. It sure did. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, that's, it's an evolving process and reading that script and then what's happening now, it's just like this onion of um, layers getting peeled back of this is actually what our country is. There's no denying that. And what can we do with that fact rather than pretending it's not that. Our hope with this whole real estate reset campaign is that education does have transformative powers. And we're hoping that in the wake of George Floyd's murder, that the United States, particularly white Americans, are open to hearing this story and to really understanding the Black systemic racism issue in a way that they've never been before. What's your sense on that? Um, my sense is absolutely, but I also know I have a very narrow point of view. You know, it's, um, you know, it's to be blunt, I, I live in a liberal world and a liberal community, but also just kind of watching through social media, the more distant contacts, you know, and what people are responding to and people asking, you know, where did you learn about Tulsa? Is there a book I can read? Um, you know, and seeing what happened with the New York Times bestseller list. Um, it seems like there's a huge group that is absolutely willing to and ready and hungry to talk and listen and learn. Um, obviously, there's a great part of our population that is absolutely equally resistant to that. So that's our, that's what is challenging in this country at this time. The value of winning the Peabody is like to be able to say thank you for looking at this piece of art that is taking a very hard look at, to be able to say thank you for everybody's um, kind of amazed. Uh, that seems like the best word. You know, it's there's many shades to it's disturbing and profound and just one of the, those things that are totally out of your control, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see these very hard conversations happening. Congratulations on all that Watchmen has done on your Peabody. And I know our Team Wealth Wednesdays and our whole Real Estate Reset campaign thanks you for the role that Watchmen is playing in waking us all up. We hope that by now you've got a better understanding of why home ownership is such an important part of building wealth. So the next step in our real estate reset is doing your research. Our Rock and Mortgage partners have the resources you need to learn more, whether you're buying a home for the first time or building on what you already have. Let's go through some of the information you'll find on their websites. First, let's look at the kind of mortgage that is best for you. If your credit score is 580 or higher, take a look at the information you'll find on rocketmortgage.com slash learn slash FHA dash loans. This will tell you about loans to consider from the Federal Housing Administration, also known as FHA loans. At rockethq.com, you can learn all about your credit score and how to improve it and make a financial plan to help you reach your goal of home ownership. And when you're ready to really drill down on everything you need to know about credit, visit rockethq.com slash learn slash credit. And how does your credit score affect what you'll pay for a mortgage? It's a very important question and you'll find the answer also at rockethq.com slash learn slash credit. And be sure to go to rocketmortgage.com slash learn for the tools you need to realize your dreams of home ownership. We're going through a tough time, no doubt about it. COVID-19 has devastated the health and economic status of too many of us. But the Black community has always demonstrated the resilience to get through unbelievable challenges that we face. And as we at Wealth Wednesdays always remind you, you are not defined by your financial situation. And net worth has got nothing to do with self-worth. 
Thanks to all of our guests and to all of you for watching. Be on the lookout for Wealth Wednesday's next edition of Real Estate Reset with our wonderful partners at Rocket Mortgage in the coming weeks. We'll show you how to prepare for home ownership, even if you're struggling with student loan debt. Thanks for joining us and take care of yourselves, everybody. Thank you.